Thank you. Right. Well, good morning. Would you believe that this morning I started my journey at 3.30 a.m. just so I could be here? I traveled from London, but my PAs had to start at 3.30 to get me ready to come here. That's how much I love you. <laughs> okay, right, if you click the first slide. So, as you can see, on the screen. I chose this quote, I exist and therefore I am worth it because despite everything from what you are observing now, because of your support and that I've received over the years, it means that I am worth saving. And you will see why later on. Click the next slide, please. So, no more, just that. Prior to my injury, I was a soldier in the Royal Signals. And the third picture in at the top, I was a physical training instructor. I served 10 years in the army. And the photograph with the the trophy, I was soldier of the year. So, and I was competing with the men, but I won. And, at, and as you can see also at the bottom pictures, I love to dress up. I, I was the one that would, despite everything, my high heels, if I wasn't wearing mini skirts, I was wearing ball gowns. And I loved the outdoors, I loved skiing. And I, for those of us here who may be above a certain age, do you remember Club 18 to 30? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I went on a skiing trip at Club 18 to 30. And it was a lovely time. I went to Austria. Very cold, but I love I loved the outdoors. And that's why I joined the army, because I love physical exercise and everything. However, in 1992, if you click, just click one, I sustained a spinal cord injury. And can you guess by that picture how I sustained my injury? Anybody? <coughs> Domestic violence. My now ex-husband, he was also in the army, in the parachute regiment, and we were having a disagreement, and I went over the sofa, hit my head on the floor and broke my neck at C5 complete. For those who don't know, it's the fifth vertebrae in the neck. And our daughter was six months old at the time. And I, when I fell, I, I didn't know anything about broken necks and spinal cord injury and anything like that. So I just assumed I was going to go into hospital for a couple of weeks and have some rest, then I'm out again. And that was 31 years ago. I spent two days in a major trauma center. And the second day of being in the major trauma center, when the nurse was getting me ready, I asked her the question that, is this how I'm going to be? And she went, crippled, you mean? I'll never forget those words. Don't say that. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And, you know, that, it still didn't register. And then I was taken by helicopter to the London Spinal Cord Injury Center where I spent eight months doing rehab. In those days, they could keep you in for eight months Nowadays, they rush you out. You're all on the conveyor belt. And unfortunately, one third, one third of people don't actually get to go to a spinal unit anymore. And sometimes the outcomes are not so good. But I was in the, in the spinal unit for eight months, 
By the time I left the final unit, my daughter had forgotten I was mum. But when I got home, um, the National Children's Home, they put, um, sent someone into the home to help me to bond again with my daughter. And now we're really good friends. And I mean, it, 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 it took some learning, but she remembered me as mum. Now she's been married 10 years and I'm a grandmom. Yeah. And I, I raised her myself. I did everything. I wanted my daughter to see that this is mom, despite everything. And I remember when she was about 14, we were on the bus together and she said, Mom, none of my friends see you as disabled. And I thought, I've done my job. I've done my job. That's what I wanted, for her to grow up as a normal child. So I had carers for me, nannies for her, and I managed my own life with help. Now, if you click the next one, please. For me, the major impairments, if you bring them all up, please. So, one more, and one more. That's it. So, of course, when it first happened, loss of movement and sensation, so, I have no sensation from here down. Can't grip, can't feel anything in my hands, can't move myself. Although I have spent years of, of making sure that my posture is correct because I don't like bad posture. Uh, and my, I, when my carers put me in the chair because I have to be hoisted to the chair and to the bed and so on, I am very much on point, I'm like, make sure that my hips are level. And for 31 years of being a wheelchair user, I would say my posture is not bad. <laughs> you know? and, and of course, our independence goal, the first thing that happened, the independence goal, now I have to rely on people to do things that were once private. Everything is now open to all and sundry. I'm doubly incontinent, so I have to have, and, if you don't know about it already, I have to have manual evacuation done every day by carers. I have a super pubic catheter for the urine to drain the urine, but that doesn't stop me from living my life. I'm not able to cough or sneeze effectively because the diaphragm is, not, is affected. So if I want to, I'm prone to chest infections. So I, if I need to cough, it's a, that's it. So I have a cough assist machine, or they're trained how to press on my tummy to do a cough assist. Anyone heard of autonomic dysreflexia? Yes, no? Wow. Well, you're gonna learn something today. <laughs> now, autonomic dysreflexia, in layman's terms, is just the body's warning system to let me know that there is something wrong in the area where I have no sensation. So for me, usually when it happens, it's the bladder. The bladder is full and the urine is not draining into the catheter bag. Therefore, the urine is going back up towards the kidneys and it triggers the blood pressure then start to rise dangerously high. And it is a medical emergency. So in my bag, I have a medical emergency card, and I also have nifedipine, which I have to have with me at all times. We, when autonomic disinfectia happens, if I'm not able to rectify whatever the situation is, where the carer or whoever is with me, they would spray under the tongue to lower the blood pressure, giving us time to actually sort out what the problem is. If it's not sorted out, worst case scenario, I can die. So that's why I have to have someone with me at all times. My care is in the back there somewhere. Poikilothermia. So I'm not able to regulate my body temperature. So where I would feel cold most of the time, even though it's not cold. Or whatever the temperature is in the room, my body will adopt to that, unfortunately. But life goes on. Sexual function, 
One of the first things they told us at the spinal unit during our education sessions, don't just go and have sex, you will get pregnant. Everything still works. And it does, because we've gone on to have children. For, for my male colleagues who are spinal cord injured, they can still have children. And many of them, one of them have just got married about a month ago. Um, it, and he's the same level of injury as myself. And a number of the colleague, my colleagues that who I work with, they have now become dads. So everything still works the same way, even though there's no sensation. Family dynamics, yes, they, it's very challenging because the individual who's got a spinal cord injury thinks that, well, I'm not, I don't look, you know, I'm not appealing enough. Or the relationships sometimes don't work. Sometimes they do, but the majority of the time they don't. I remember when I was in the spinal unit, a, there was a gentleman who sustained a spinal cord injury and his wife left him at the hospital. She just left, said she couldn't handle it. Of course we can work and of course we can play and we are vulnerable because we are at the mercy of carers and, and, and strangers coming to your home to look after you. And many times, what I find, and please excuse me, but I've had 31 years of experience of different healthcare professionals considering that they know more than we do. We are the one living with the spinal cord injury. We know how it affects us. My consultant at the spinal unit said to his registrar, he can only say what he, tell us what it says in the books. He doesn't know what it's like to live with a spinal cord injury. So ask us, because we are the ones going through it. However, in spite of all of this, when you're ready, Ruth. So for us, spinal cord injured people, all of these are the concerns that we have. So whether it's fertility, we, we still want to have children. Psychological effects, one of the largest problem with us as spinal cord injured people, we are five times more likely than the national average to try and take our own lives within the first year of being injured. And I, I work for the Spinal Injuries Association, and one of the things that we are adamant, we are trying our best to show people that life goes on. It doesn't matter, this has happened, yes. It's not nice, we know but you can still have a fulfilled life. And as you can see, there's so, just like you, all the concerns you may have, we have them too. But we have, we, it's now compounded with having to live with a spinal cord injury. And in your services, you provide the services that would help us with all of these concerns. And so we are relying on you quite a lot to support us. And you do, and I'll show you on the next slide. So, since my injury, you would say that, well, what can I do? I thought, when I first was discharged, what can I do? And a lovely physiotherapist, not physiotherapist, occupational therapist came to the home, and she said to me, what would you like to do? And I thought, what can I do? I can't use my hands. I can't walk, I, what can I do? She never said to me, you can't do this or you can't. She said, what would you like to do? And then she said to me, what about volunteering in an office and we can make equipment to put on your hand that will help you to type and so on. And me being the outdoors person thought, no. But she th I said, okay, I'll try. And I went and I tried for two weeks. I was bored to tears. And I thought, my God, no. So then she said, she didn't give up. She said, okay, what about going to college? And I'm like, I'm too old for this. She said, no, try it. So I went and I did a computer course. And I did that for a year. And that was fantastic. I enjoyed that. And I enjoyed studying because what I realized, not being able to write, I had to commit more to memory. And my brain got better. And one thing we don't, many of us don't realize, it's a muscle. And the more you use it, the better it becomes. 
And so I thought, okay, every year I would go back and study something that of interest to me. And I enjoyed that. And then I got involved with access, looking at access into buildings and, and places. And I went to Denmark two years post-injury. And while we were in Denmark, there were about 30 people from around the EU. And the conference had to be conducted in English because there were six of us from England. We couldn't speak any other language apart from English. And the other people from Europe, they could speak English. So it was conducted in English. And I made up my mind that when I returned to the UK, I would learn a foreign language. And when I came back, I went to college and studied German because I felt it was the, the easiest one to study because it's closer to English. And then I did Italian, then I did Spanish, and then I did French. And I was doing that year after year after year. I would go back and continue studying. And now I'm t learning Turkish. And I just love that, you know. <laughs> and then... And then I said, okay, I, I, one thing I'm going to say to you, I remained with my ex-husband, he's ex now, but I remained with him two years post-injury until he threatened to throw me to the window. I thought, well, we better go our separate ways. And <laughs> he didn't want to go, but he went. And, um, but one of the things that I realized that he was always getting away with things. And I thought, how, I'm telling the truth to the police but he somehow, he, could, he can sell ice to Eskimos, honestly. I've never seen a man, a man like this. So I decided, someone said to me, well, why not go to university? And again, I said, I'm too old. But I said, okay, I want to know how the law works. So I went to university and I did a law degree. And then I said to myself, okay, I don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> but, but I love the subject. And I loved studying as well. So what I did, I applied for, when I graduated, I applied for a scholarship at the university, and I won the scholarship, and I studied international human rights law, master's degree. And I said, I'd love to work for the UN. But while I'm working for the UN, while I'm waiting to apply, I still haven't applied yet, I work for, I work for the Spinal Injuries Association supporting newly injured people. And so uh, for the last nine years, I've worked supporting newly injured people. So I'd go into hospitals, care homes, um, rehab centers, into their own homes in the community to find spinal cord injured people, show them what's possible. I would do in-service training for healthcare professionals around the whole... I, I first started in the south of London, Kent, and East Sussex, and I traveled to all these places by public transport. Then I covered the whole of London. And I loved doing that job. And I went skiing again, as you can see. I went to Sweden and I skied. I even skied at night and I saw the Northern Lights. I loved that, it was really good. I've been over the top of the old two. I, I was a poster girl at Heathrow. You, you know, I, do, I, I was involved with a forum there where we would take people with disabilities from the train station to the airport, through security, back around to border force, come back around to show them how it would be if they were traveling. And I also drive. I drove to Manchester and back from London. So my vehicle is rear access. As you can see, the controls on the right. So my hand would sit like this. I use my wrist to steer. This hand forward for braking backwards for accelerating, and the indicators are in my headrest, so I tap right or tap left. So it's like patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, next one. And look, I've been rock climbing, indoor rock climbing, outdoor rock climbing, canoeing, abseiling, zip wire, off-road biking, all of that not being able to use my hands not being able to move myself. And again, and as you can see, I have not let it stop me. I have a full life. If you click again, and apart from that, 
I do a lot of volunteering and I work full time. You have no excuse. <laughs> a photography judge, a guest lecturer at two universities. I was a consultant on EastEnders. I get involved in so many things. So what are you waiting for? Thank you very much. Thank you.